Good morning, everybody. It is Wednesday, March 25th. Um, super excited for today for a couple of reasons. Um, one, we have noticed almost everybody is logging on to Google Classroom and having success with our videos and the work. So Ms. Cromarty and I are so happy about that, that it seems like the transition um, is a lot smoother this week. We have our routines down um, and we're just really happy about that. So thank you so much for bearing with us um, through the technical difficulties and through just this weird um, time, but most of you are doing a great job so far. So thank you so much. Um, another thing I'm really excited about today, you should have seen I posted um, last night or yesterday afternoon on Google Classroom an announcement, um, and this announcement has a Zoom link to it. I'm not sure if y'all have done Zooms yet. I know Matt's going to be using them at some point if they haven't already, um, but you should be able to just click the link that is in that announcement. And at the time that I told you to in the announcement and you might need to um, download zoom to your computer but otherwise it should just automatically bring you to the video chat um, so um, every homeroom has a different time so if you happen to be the two o'clock time then you would click your homerooms link that's posted on your Google Classroom at two o'clock. Again, you might have to um, download Zoom onto your computer. It will tell you if you need to, and then it should bring you to the video. Um, I had never used it um, until a couple of days ago, and it's been pretty easy for me, so I hope it's pretty easy for you. So I can't wait to see some of you and hear your voices and just check in and see how y'all are doing. Awesome. Um, so the only problem that Ms. Cromarty and I have been noticing is that um, some people are logging on really late at night. I'm talking like, you know, midnight, 3 a.m. Um, and are having questions. Um, we're asleep. I know that um, some of you are allowed to stay up late, um, and I know that we said that you can get you know your work done at any time throughout the day, but we mean throughout the day. So that's why the deadline is midnight. Um, so if you're passing in past midnight, you are passing in late. So make sure that you're getting your work done during the day one, so that it's on time, and two, so that if you do have questions or you're struggling with a question, you can reach out to Ms. Cromarty and I and get help. So just a little note about that. Um, otherwise, we have a pretty simple assignment for today um, and tomorrow, actually. Um, just like we did Monday and Tuesday, we're going to be reading um, one of my light bulbs just blew out. I never use this room and I've been using this room for these videos just because I, I have like a comfy chair and um, the light from the window and it's pretty plain in here so you don't like get distracted from anything but I never usually use this room and um, so this light has been on a lot more than usual and one of the light bulbs just blew. That was a little scary. All right. Sorry, got a little distracted there. Um, anyways, today and tomorrow are going to be very similar to Monday and Tuesday um, where we read a chapter and split up the activity over two days because the activity is really long. Um, but same exact concept, text-dependent questions with claim evidence and reasoning. Awesome. So let's go ahead and get started with our do now. So please get that notebook that you've been using. If you have not been using a notebook and you've been using scrap paper, go ahead and grab some scrap paper. 
Again, make sure that you are keeping these in a safe place. You will be turning them in when we return to school. Go ahead and grab yourself a pencil or something to write with. And grab your Dragon Wings book if you have it. If you don't have it, you can open the readings attached to this assignment on Google Classroom. So notebook or piece of paper, pencil or something to write with, Dragon Wings book, or the readings on Google Classroom. Awesome. Pause this video if you're not ready. I am going to move on to our do now. The focus word today is clutch. And clutch means to hold on to something tightly. So as you can see in this picture, the person is clutching the money. They don't want their money to fly away. Maybe they're outside or maybe someone's trying to steal their money. So they are clutching their hands so tight that it looks like a fist. An example sentence from this chapter will be, I clutched my boots against my chest. So again, like I started to do this week, I'm not going to hold this up for the full four minutes because I noticed that my hand is not as steady as I think it is. And um, I was moving the paper kind of in and out of focus at times. So please pause this video and complete this do now. Make sure you write your own sentence. And if you have the time, you could even write some extra sentences for extra credit. This word is a tier two word, meaning that it can be used across many different situations, parts of life, content areas, things like that. Awesome. And to make things easy, um, we actually don't have notes today because, like I said, um, things are going to be pretty similar to yesterday and Monday. So if you're having trouble today, you should look back to your notes from yesterday and Monday. Um, yesterday we had notes about answering text-dependent questions, how you should, you know, skim the page for a keyword when you're having trouble finding an answer, how you should make inferences if the answer isn't obvious. Um, and the day before that, we talked about how to introduce evidence, you know, how you should use phrases like in the text it says or according to the text. Um, you should be using page numbers, quotation marks, things like that. Awesome. All things that you already know. So, um, if you haven't already, please grab your Dragon Wings book and open up the readings online if you need to. And we are stopping and jotting again today. So I'm also going to have you open the assignment that's on Google Classroom, which looks like this. Chapter 6, Text Dependent Questions. So everyone should have the book or the readings on Google Classroom open and everyone should also have the assignment open, Chapter 6, Text Dependent Questions. Go ahead and pause this video if you need a little bit longer to look for that assignment. All right, so because we're stopping and jotting, before we start reading, I'm gonna read you the directions and make sure that we know where we have to stop first. So chapter six, text-dependent questions. Directions, read the pages indicated below for each question. Answer each question in two to three sentences. So that's the same exact thing as we did yesterday and Monday. Number one, read pages 123 to 124. Then stop and answer the following question. What is Moonshadow's point of view of Polk Street? How do you know? Provide three examples that show Moonshadow's point of view. 
So as a reminder, point of view is how someone feels about something. And a lot of the time, the author or the narrator is not going to come out and tell us directly how they feel. Like in the book, Moonshadow is not going to say, my point of view of Polk Street is. So it's something that we have to infer um, and take an educated guess about. So this is a difficult question, so I'm going to do this one with you. So to figure out how Moon Shadow feels about Polk Street, we need to read those pages. So please open your book to page 123. And that is the first page of chapter six. And again, we're looking for Moonshadow's point of view of Polk Street, P-O-L-K. Page 123, Chapter 6, The Demoness, May 1905. In those days, Polk Street was for the poorer demons. There were lots of common little shops like grocery stores or poultry markets and wooden tenement houses, some four stories high, into which the poor demons crowded. In the morning, you would see the demons in undershirts and coats swinging lunch buckets as they walked to the factories, and the demonesses hurrying to be on time in the rich mansions one block to the west, where they worked as laundresses or housekeepers or housemaids. There would be young demons who were clerks in offices, tugging at their stiff celluloid collars as they ran to catch the cable cars, and shop girls in their long dresses walking in groups, talking in excited voices. All day, the streets would be filled with noise, the sound of the hooves of the great dray horses as they clopped up and down the cobblestones and the merry ringing of the cable cars on the streets that crossed Polk, page 124. The demonesses might be back later in the day, pushing baby carriages or walking with their employers' wives doing the day's shopping. And in the later afternoon, everyone would come home looking tired, hardly noticing the demons who lit the gas lamps. I had been through streets like Polk Street before, when we had picked up laundry, but we had only been passing through then. Now we were here to stay. The tenement houses had the same odd, flat faces and the same drab colors, making them look all the same, as if they had been hatched in the same brood. Their doorways gaped like mouths and their windows gleamed like eyes, so that each one of them looked like the stark, empty face of a multi-eyed demon. We stopped finally in front of a neat little Victorian house with an odd shape. It seemed to have a little more character than the tenement houses. I found out later that it had eight sides instead of being built in the shape of a square. The demon who had built the house had wanted it that way. Actually, it made that house seem all the more scary, because behind its iron fence, it looked like some strange beast that had to be kept specially separate and fenced off from the others. And we're going to pause there because that's the bottom of page 124. And now I'm going to reread the question. Read pages 123 to 124. Check. I did that, so I checked that step off. Then stop. Check. That's what we're doing right now. And answer the following question. What is Moonshadow's point of view of Polk Street? How do you know? Provide three examples that show Moonshadow's point of view. So again, the book did not come out and say, this is how Moonshadow feels about Polk Street. So if I were to infer, I heard a lot of... Um, kind of gloomy words. Gloomy was one of our vocab words a while ago. Gloomy means kind of like, um, kind of like what it's like outside today. Like it's gray, cold, um, dreary, doesn't remind me of happiness. You know, usually sunlight and bright colors would remind me of happiness. Um, usually gray or neutral colors remind me of just kind of blah. And so that's kind of how he's describing this town. Some specific examples 
is he uses the word poor a lot. Now, poor is a word that's usually used in a negative way um, in the world. Um, money makes the world go round and it's usually a positive thing to have money because then you don't have to stress out about how to get food or clothes or whatever you want. So poor is usually looked at as a negative thing. Um, even though many of us go through it at some point in our lives. Um, but unfortunately, it's still viewed as a negative thing. And so that's why Mean Shadow keeps using that word poor. Because he's viewing Polk Street in a negative way. So another word that I noticed he uses a lot is the word drab. D-R-A-B. Drab is very similar to gloomy or gray. Um, blah. And he also talks about how noisy it is. Noise. So those are my three example words. Poor, drab, and noise. You should copy that down onto yours. I'm kind of working backwards here because it helps me personally if I break down the keywords that I saw first. So those are the three examples that show Moonshadow's point of view are those keywords. And now I'm going to work backwards and figure out his point of view. So poor, drab, and noise. So um, I did notice that um, there was already an example on here. I think when I printed it, um, when I printed it, I think it still had the example that Miss Cromarty gave to our class a year ago. Um, I think we just forgot to delete it um, before we saved it for this year. Um, so if you saw that, that's okay, that's great. Um, because that's very similar to the point of view that I was going to write. Um, so Ms. Cromarty's example said, Moonshadow's point of view is negative. That's exactly what I was going to write. Because it is noisy and bad demons live there. That's where all the poor people live. So um, I wouldn't agree that bad demons live there because um, he hasn't said anything about violence or about the way the demons treat each other, or the Tang people, or anything like that. So for all we know, maybe this part of town has nice demons in it. We don't know that yet. So I'm going to take that part, out, that part out, about the bad demons living there. Um, but his point of view is definitely negative. Moonshot's point of view is negative because he describes the town, or this part of town, as poor, drab, and noisy, which are all words typically associated with things people don't like. So that is the point of view that I've created. If you had already wrote down the one that we had from last year, that's fine. But I think this is a little bit more accurate, especially with the example keywords that we just did together. So go ahead and pause the video if you're not done writing this down. 
But so number one should say, Moonshadow's point of view is negative because he describes this part of town as poor, drab, and noisy, which are all words typically associated with things people don't like. And our three examples of Moonshadow's point of view are poor, drab, and noise. Awesome. So if you're not finished with number one, you should pause this video and finish number one. Um, I'm going to move on to um, number two. And I'm not going to be doing number two with you. However, I will um, let you know when I'm done reading number two's pages so that you can pause the video and get that question done. So number two says, read pages 128 to 129, then stop and answer the following question. How does Windrider want his son to prepare himself to meet Miss Whitlaw? What explanation does he give? So, Miss Whitlaw is a new character. I'm assuming it's the woman that they're going to be renting from, their landlord. Um, but we don't know for sure yet. And we just know that Windrider wants Moonshadow prepared to meet this person. So, maybe this is an important person. And it looks like Moonshadow is going to ask why, and when Ryder is going to give an explanation. So that's going to be, we'll, st we'll stop there at the end of page 129. We left off at the bottom of page 124, so that's where I'm going to continue. Bottom of page 124. It squatted there like some toad made of glass and wood and shingles. In one corner was a turret with a big bay window looking out on a small garden surrounded by the fence. Here we are, father said. He picked me up and swung me down to the sidewalk. You watch our things, he added. I watched uncomfortably as he and Handclap each grabbed a box of our belongings and walked into the alley between the iron fence of the house and the tenement next door. When they disappeared from sight, I wasn't sure what to do. On the one hand, I was supposed to watch our boxes, but on the other hand, I didn't want to be alone. I walked cautiously toward the mouth of the alley, but I couldn't see father. It seemed to me at that time that there might be any number of demons waiting in their houses, waiting patiently for me to turn my back so they could leap upon me and take over my body, or torture me, or do the hundred and one things that demons can do to people. I looked up at the moment and saw a pink demonic face staring down at me from the glass eye of the turret. When it saw me looking, it vanished. I ran back to the wagon. I stayed there all the time, clinging to the familiar shape of the company's wagon, while father and hand clap unloaded our things. It did not take long, since we did not have very much. Page 126. Hand clap sat on the seat of the wagon for a moment, the reins in his hand, but reluctant to tell Red Rabbit to go. We were just as reluctant. We stood on the sidewalk beside the wagon. My hand held on to the side. For want of something to do, Handclap scratched his neck and looked around. Then he began to sniff the air. There's money to be made here by a man with the know-how, he said. I can just smell the gold coins piled in all these houses, and I can just see all these poor demons sitting on top of their heaps of gold, crying because their clock's busted, and they don't know how to fix it. They'll be mobbing your place day and night to fix things once they know you're here. Father laughed. Careful, or some jealous demon will wish us bad luck. Handclap sat back in the seat. With that charm I gave you, listen, if some dumb demon is too ignorant to recognize its power and comes a knocking at your door, why, you tell me and I'll tell the Enlighteners, and they'll come flying across the ocean and gobble that demon up from the top of his hair down to his big ugly feet. You do that, Father slapped Handclap's leg. Now you better be going. Red Rabbit looks hungry. He's always hungry, Handclap said. Page 127. Remember, though, I said, he likes a carrot in the morning. I'll remember. Handclap nodded a goodbye to father and winked at me. Then he shook the reins, but Red Rabbit would not leave. He looked around at father as if telling him to get back on the wagon. Go on, you fat, overgrown, sassy rabbit, Handclap ordered as he shook the reins, but Red Rabbit stubbornly stayed put. Get out of here before I skin you and make a jacket out of your hide, father said. With his hat, he whacked Red Rabbit's rump real good. With a snort of hurt pride, Red Rabbit started in his harness, but then he stayed put. Go on, Father said, and he whacked Red Rabbit even harder. With a sad twist of his head, Red Rabbit turned away from Father and began to clop along in his slow, methodical pace. 
From the way he went, you might have thought he was pulling a ton of metal instead of an empty wagon. Together we watched them roll down the cobblestone street and turn the corner. Come along, father put his hand on my shoulder and steered me around to face the alley. We walked past the iron fence in the garden to a big backyard that was filled with trees and grass. Page 128. A stable stood in one corner of the yard. Father swung the door open. It creaked on its hinges, and I could smell the disinfectant Father had used to clean out the stable that morning. In one corner of the room was a pot-bellied stove with a pipe leading up to the ceiling. Our mats and blankets were laid in one corner. Boards had been propped against one wall for the day when Father would build shelves. Until that time, our stuff would stay in our boxes. I wandered around the room and touched everything to reassure myself that it was real and not some demonic illusion. Father waited patiently in the doorway with his arms folded. When I went back to him, I nodded that it was all right. He grinned. The first thing he did was to put up a shelf. Then he set Monkey and the Buddha to be on it. He placed the cup of soil before them and stuck some incense sticks into the soil and lit them so that Monkey and the Buddha to be would be comfortable in the pleasant smoke. Finally, Father nodded his head in the direction of the house. Now we have to meet our landlady. Her name is Miss Whitlaw. Miss Whitlaw? I practiced the syllables several times until Father sighed. That will have to do for now. Then he spat into his hand and smoothed back my hair. Page 129. He frowned. How do you ever manage to get so dirty? I washed my face this morning like you told me. Not very well, he said. He picked up an empty pail and went outside. I watched from the doorway as he worked the pump handle until the water splashed into the pail. He came back inside and got some clean hand towels. He threw me one. Now wash, he said. You'd think, I grumbled, that we were visiting the Empress herself. Father wet his towel in the pail and began to wash his face. Your mother was always polite to everyone. She always said that you never knew if that person might have been some king or queen in a former life. But these are white demons, I protested. Father opened our trunk and got out some clean, well-ironed shirts, some of White Deer's masterpieces. You can take that up with your mother when she comes here herself. Until then, we'll do as she says. Understand? I said nothing because I was still annoyed, but I rubbed my face vigorously anyway. In fact, harder than mother used to do it. I was not going to be accused of being unfaithful. When I had changed into my clean shirt, father announced we were ready. Finally, we stepped outside. So we're going to pause there because we read pages 128 to 129 and we need to stop and answer the following question. How does Windrider want his son to prepare himself to meet Miss Whitlock? So in other words, what did Windrider tell Moonshadow to do to prepare to meet Miss Whitlock? And why? What explanation does Windrider give as to why Moonshadow should be preparing? So you should pause this video and answer that question. That's number two. When you are done answering number two, you can play the video again. And the next question says number three. Read pages 130 to 134, then stop and answer the following question. Describe the first meeting that Moonshadow and Windrider have with their new landlady. What are Moonshadow's first impressions of Miss Whitlaw? So this just means, um, you know, what does he think of her at first? This is their first time meeting. What does he think of her? So I'm going to pick up on the top of page 130. And I will stop at the end of 134 so you can answer number three. Standing there in that empty backyard, I was afraid, and then I thought of the old ones. Perhaps they were watching. I had to try to act brave, at least. Father took my hand as if he knew I needed the support, and we started toward the demon house. On the way, he pointed to the outhouse that sat at the end of the dirt lot. Then we went up the back steps and knocked at the door. Under my shirt, I wore the charm to keep demons away. I think that the demoness had been waiting for us, because Father had no sooner knocked once than she opened the door. She was the first demoness that I had ever seen this close up, and I stared. 
I had expected her to be ten feet tall with blue skin and to have a face covered with warts and earlobes that hung all the way down to her knees so that her earlobes would bounce off the knees when she walked. And she might have a pot belly, shiny as a mirror, and big sacks of flesh for breasts, and maybe she would only be wearing a loincloth. Instead, I saw a petite lady, not much bigger than hand clap. She had a large nose, but not absurdly so, and a red face and silver hair, and she wore a long dress of what looked like white cotton, over which she put a red apron. The dress was freshly starched and crinkled when she moved and smelled good. She had a smile like the listener, she who hears prayers, who refused release from the cycle of lives until all her brothers and sisters, too, could be freed from sin. Page 131. Well, she said, well. I looked at her eyes and saw a friendly twinkle in them that made her seem even less threatening. There were demons, after all, who could be kindly disposed. I suddenly felt calm and unafraid as I stood before her. My father nudged me. I bowed carefully and presented our present. It was a paper picture of the stove king, who reported to the Lord of Heaven each year about what the family had done, both the good things and the bad things. It was customary each New Year's to bribe the little stove king. Some families offered him cookies and tea, which he could snack on during his journey to heaven. Others took a more direct approach and smeared his face with honey. Still, others bought little paper horses and carts so he could ride up to heaven in style. After all these centuries of tender loving care for millions of Tang families, the Stove King had gotten quite pudgy. Father thought it might be a nice gesture to give the picture to the demoness, and I agreed, for the little Stove King might take the demon's ignorance into account and give a good report for them for the Stove King was basically as kind and gentle a person as one was likely to find among the gods. Page 132. The demoness turned it over and over in her hands, in puzzlement, until Father spoke, He Chinese saint of kitchen. I doubt if the demoness would have had a heathen god inside her kitchen, but a holy man was a different matter. Well, isn't that nice? She smiled pleasantly and stepped aside from the door. Please, do come in. We sat down at a table covered with a cheery red checkered tablecloth in a cold, abstract arrangement of squares, the kind of pattern the demons favored. And of course, all the smells to her kitchen were different. The demoness went to her ice box, a strange device, and took out a pitcher and poured a large glass of some white liquid for me, for herself and for father. She made tea, using water from a copper tea kettle that she must have already boiled and set at the edge of the stove to keep hot. Then the demoness set down the biggest plate of things before me. They were brown-colored and shaped like men, and icing had been used to make eyes, noses, and button coats. There, it sounded like ginger burr and cookies, she said. I looked to father to explain the demonic word, which I did not know. Page 133. Gingerbread, father said slowly. It's a kind of sweet ginger-flavored cookie or cake. And what's this stuff? I looked dubiously at the glass of thick white liquid. Cow's milk. I almost made a face, but caught myself. But that's cow urine. No, no, stupid. Milk comes from the cow's udders. Now drink it. You must not offend the lady. I glanced at the demoness. She smiled at me. It was nice of her to think of me as a demon child, I guess. I sipped the liquid and managed not to make a face at the awful, greasy taste. Go on and have a cookie, father ordered me sternly, and you better eat all of it. The milk did not make me inclined to trust the demoness's cookies much. They look like dung, I said. I don't care if it is dung. She made it. You eat it. I will if you will. Father sighed. He turned to the demoness. May I? Certainly, she said with a gracious smile. Father took one of the cookies and munched at it. Well, he did not change into a toad or anything, and he did not throw up. I had been expecting either possibility. I tried one of the cookies on the plate before me. Page 134. The taste was heavenly. I gobbled up one and started for another. Hey, father snapped. First you don't want any. Now you want to gobble them all up like a pig? Go on. The demoness pushed the plate closer to me. She smiled in real pleasure. I suddenly liked the way all the wrinkles in her face crinkled up in tiny smiles. I had another cookie, and then I was so thirsty that even the white stuff did not taste so bad this time. Father and the demoness talked politely about the neighborhood. Where was the best place to shop for what? The demoness seemed genuinely to want to help us, and I began to think that she was one of the good demons. I looked about her kitchen. Curiosity got the better of politeness. 
When I finally finished looking around her kitchen, I realized I had gone through four more of the cookies. Father noticed the almost empty plate at the same time. Look at this boy, he said in exasperation. He eat enough for four pigs. He started to apologize to the demoness, but she only smiled prettily again. There's only one real compliment for a cook, and that's for her guests to eat everything up. You must take the rest of the cookies with you. She smoothed her apron over her lap and winked at me secretly. And we're going to stop there because we read pages 130 to 134. Now we're going to answer question three. Describe the first meeting that Moonshadow and Windrider have with their new landlady. What are Moonshadow's first impressions of Miss Whitlaw? So, so far, what does he think of Miss Whitlaw? So you're going to go ahead and pause this video and answer number three. I'm going to go ahead and continue reading the chapter. But first, um, for our final question today, which is number four, it says read pages 135 to 144, then stop and answer the following question. Who is the child that Moonshadow meets? What are the two things she shows Moonshadow that fascinate him, so that he's interested in? All right. So let's finish this chapter and finish this question. We'll do the rest of the questions tomorrow. I'm at the top of page 135. You too, kind. Father spread his hands. You make us ashamed. He kicked me gently under the table. Yes, a shame, I piped up. At that moment, I heard a crash and the kitchen door swung open and there was a demon girl about my age lying on her stomach. She must have been listening at the door and lost her balance. It was only later that I realized her face was not always a bright red, but was only that way when she was angry or perhaps embarrassed. The demoness jumped up and slapped her hand to her forehead. Oh, that child, she said. She'll be the death of me yet. You, Robin, I told you not to spy on our new guests. You said I wasn't to look, the demon girl said as she got up dusting herself off. You didn't say anything about listening. Father hid a smile as the demoness let out a little sigh. Well, the harm's been done. Let me introduce you. She turned around with an apologetic smile. This is my niece, Robin. When my brother and sister-in-law died, I took her in. Auntie calls me her burden, the demon girl added. I call you my treasure, too. The demoness slipped her arm around the demon girl and held her against her side, though not very often, I'll admit. Father stood up and bowed. He poked me, and I slid off the chair and did the same. I did not mean to be rude when I stared at her, but she was the first demon child I had seen this close. Page 136. For all I knew, demon children were not like me, but like dolls or toys that the demons took out of boxes for a while to decorate their sidewalks and then stored away again inside their homes. The demon girl was like and unlike what I imagined, but one of them to be. She seemed like a dwarf copy of her aunt, and her red face looked like a lantern that had been filled with blood and was going to burst at any moment. Her hair was the strangest color, golden red, as though her head had just burst into flame. She wore a short dress that I recognized as gingham, and her knees and legs had many scratches and scars on them. And then I saw something in the demon girl's hand. It was a long rod with lenses at one end and a card with two pictures on it, held in a rack at the other. The demoness saw the direction in which I was looking. Show Moon Shadow our stereopticon, Robin. The demon girl held the device up to her face so the lenses were against her eyes. You look through it like this, she said. Here, you try it. I put the viewer to my eyes and almost gasped, for it seemed as if I was suddenly in another world and no longer in the kitchen. Huge falls thundered right before me. Page 137. That's Niagara Falls, the demon girl said. Later, it was explained to me that each eye sees the same object from a slightly different angle, so that each eye has a slightly different picture. It's the brain that combines the two pictures together into one image and creates the stereoptical effect, the depth that the world seems to have for us. The stereopticon card has two pictures of the same object, but each picture is taken from a slightly different angle. Each of the viewer's eyes focuses on one of the pictures of the brain, and trying to put them together gives the viewer the illusion of depth, as if he were not looking at two pictures on a flat card, but rather as if he were looking at the real thing. Of course, at that moment, I did not know all this, so I was very impressed. Father looked through it for a long time. Dragon magic, I asked him. It's magic of the mind, if not of the dragons, father said. 
He handed it back to the demon girl, pleased and surprised. It, it, fun. He struggled for the right words and could not find them. Yes, Mr. Lee, the demoness said with a faint smile. We travel all the way around the world with it and yet never leave our parlor. We have more cards. Would you like to see them? Oh, yes, father said. Page 138. She led us out of the kitchen into a hallway smelling of polish and old wood, and then into a carpeted room with a bird inside a glass jar and books stacked neatly in a bookcase to one side. Later I learned that most of them were travel books. The demoness and the demon girl would go to almost any lecturer who was giving a magic lantern show with slides of his travels. The demoness's father had never really had any time to take her traveling, which was too bad since she loved to travel. But as the demon girl fetched the box of viewing cards, I was looking at one corner of the room that was filled with a blend of strange colors. I looked up to see that it was the result of a window. Would you like to see our stained glass window? The demoness asked gently. I glanced at father and he nodded, so I walked over to it until I was about two yards away. You can take a closer look than that, the demoness said. It was a tall, rectangular window. On the outside, there was a border of flowers and vines made from bits of colored glass set into a lead frame. But on the inner part of the window, there was a great green creature breathing yellow and red flames and biting at the spear that a silver-clad demon thrust into him. With a rustle of skirts, the demoness joined me. What's that? I asked, pointing at the green creature. Page 139. A dragon, she said. You know, it's a very wicked animal that breathes fire and goes about eating people and destroying towns. St. George killed many of them. I looked at father, horrified, for these demons had turned the story of dragons upside down if they thought a holy man would kill them. But father answered for me. Very interesting. We have dragons too. Do you have a Chinese saint who did the same things as St. George? The demoness asked with obvious satisfaction. You should tell them the truth about dragons, I told father. Maybe dragons in the demon lands are all as evil as they believe, father shrugged. At any rate, when you're someone's guest, you don't correct her no matter how wrong she may be. The demoness had waited patiently during this exchange. Now she asked, what did he say? My boy, he asked if you make, father lied. Oh no, Papa had the window brought from England. She lovingly traced the curves of part of the lead frame. Papa said no home was complete without a stained glass window. And in my heart, I agreed with her, for it was a lovely thing even if the scene it depicted was all wrong. The demoness added, Papa also said that no one owned a stained glass window. It was meant to be shared, so you feel free to come look through it any time you want, Moonshadow. Page 140. You too kind. Fiddlesticks, Miss Whitlaw said. In the meantime, Robin had sat down on a bench before a box-like contraption taller than her and made of black wood. She lifted up a kind of lid about halfway down on its front, exposing thin white and black tiles of ivory. She began poking at the tiles aimlessly, producing strange musical sounds. What's that? I asked father. The demons call it an upright piano, father said. Miss Whitlaw must have recognized the last two words. Robin plays it very well. Oh, but you play so much better, auntie, Robin said. Now, Robin, Miss Whitlaw said, I don't think they want to hear an old lady's antiquated repertory. Please, we not here before. Father poked me in the side. Yes, please, I chimed in. Robin left the bench as Miss Whitlaw came over. She smoothed her long skirt underneath her and sat down with a little flounce like a young girl. She was smiling in a pleased but embarrassed manner. She turned to her niece. What should I play, Robin? Robin was standing beside the upright piano. Play simple gifts, auntie. Miss Whitlaw inclined her head to one side. Well, all right, page 141. Her fingers moved over the tiles, drawing deep, resonant sounds from within the big box, and she began to sing in a high, sweet voice. We did not follow too many of the words then, but the demoness played it, and Robin sang it so often that I eventually got them. "'Tis the gift to be simple, tis the gift to be free, tis the gift to come down where you ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, t'will be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained to, to bow and to bend, we shan't be ashamed. To turn, turn will be our delight, till by turning, turning, we come round right. And just then, the late sun must have shone on this side of the building. The dragon suddenly stood out in luminous greens and yellows and reds, and I thought to myself, if there is light that comes from the magical pearl of the dragon's forehead, then it must be like the light of this window. Page 142. The shafts of colored light shot across the room to where the demoness sat. 
Her skirt seemed to gather in a distorted picture of the dragon in the window, or not really distorted, but an image that was alive, for the glass had been cast unevenly, so that there were odd little flame-like curves in the colors. The image seemed to be so full of life and fact that it was bursting out of its outline. And I thought to myself, Mother must be right. The kind of person who would own such a window must surely have been royalty in some other life. I found myself wishing more than ever that Mother could be with me right then. I was sure she would agree with me. Later, as I got to know the demoness, I was to realize that despite her demonic appearance and dress and speech and customs, there was a gentle strength, a sweet loving patience, coupled with an iron hard core of what she thought was right and proper. I was always to think of her as the demoness who kept the dragon fire locked inside a window. After the song, the demoness spoke some more about dragons, and I began to feel sorry for her. Her dragons were sly, spiteful creatures who stole people's gold and killed people for malicious fun. Page 143. They sounded more and more like what mother and grandmother had told me about the outlaw dragons. It was a shame that the demoness had not gotten to know the true dragons of the sea who were wise and benevolent. But father only smiled when I told him that, later when we were back in our stable. You know how the demons are, he said. They turn everything upside down and get everything the wrong way. As I helped father tug off his boots, I asked him something else that had been bothering me. Do you think the demoness is the ghost of a tang woman? I mean, she could have forgotten a lot even if she was a ghost. Father grunted as one boot came off. Maybe, maybe not. I began to work off his other boot. Or do you think the demoness might have been some tang woman who did something so terrible in a former life that she was reborn here as a white demoness? When the boot came off in my hands, father massaged his feet. Maybe that too. I don't think she can be a ghost, I decided finally. I never heard of a ghost banished from the Middle Kingdom and made to forget so many things. Page 144. But then she must have done something pretty bad if she was reborn over here as a demoness instead of back in the Middle Kingdom, at least as some kind of animal. Father tousled my hair. You think too much. As I lay down on my mat and pulled the blanket up about my neck, it seemed to me that if this was the case, the demoness would surely be reborn as a rich, tang woman in her next life. I even toyed with the idea that perhaps we had been close to each other in some former life, a mother and child even. If that were so, I at least owed it to her to set her straight on dragons. It was with these thoughts that I fell asleep. End of chapter 6. So your last thing to do today for ELA is to finish number four. So we read pages 135 to 144. Now you should be stopping and answering the question, who is the child that Moon Shadow beats? We learned her name, I believe, on page 135. And what are the two things that she shows Moon Shadow that fascinate him? Fascinate means like excite him or surprise him. Awesome. Um, again, if you want to join us, if you're watching this video this morning and you want to join us um, this afternoon for our Zoom meeting, that announcement is still on Google Classroom. Again, you just click the link and um, when you click the link, it might make you download Zoom. Um, but like I said, I hadn't used Zoom until a couple days ago. I had to download it. It was very easy. Um, yeah. So hoping to see some of you there. Um, if I don't see you, please um, reach out via Google Classroom, email, calls, or texts for any questions that you have about today's assignment. Um, take care, stay healthy, um, and that is all for today.